say something that I talked about Tuesday, but I found this this week, and it, it, it knocked me off the chairs. I, you know, what I saw, I mean, I've been talking about UFO uh, forces coming to Earth and civilizing this planet, and incidentally, at the end, at the conclusion tonight, I think I've got a, a pretty startling thing that, that we should go out with a bang tonight. Anyhow, I've been, uh, I've been proposing that Jesus was an alien from the UFO forces, and all this stuff is mind-boggling, you know? And I'm just proposing it. I can't prove a thing. I don't know who wrote what. I don't know whether they were all on uh, magic mushrooms when they wrote this stuff. I don't know. Um, but anyhow, you know, still, regardless, y you, you connect the dots, and it gets you interested enough to where you, you open up things, and you start looking, and, and you things start to fall into place. And many people just can't handle this kind of talk, you know, because we have convinced ourselves that there is nobody else out there but us, and we're superior, and Jesus is coming, and, you know, I'm a Christian, and all this crazy stuff. But this here has shocked me. And, um, and though I don't want to break the train of thought on the Emerald Tablets or 2012, I just figured, you know, this is too much. And yet, let me show you a picture of our our latest uh, witness here. There it is. I, you know, and, and this is a real, live, living thing. Okay? Magnified probably 10,000 times, you know. It's a bug. It's an insect. That's all it is. Just a bug. The kind that you swat and... I don't, but people do. Let me give you what I... After you see this, this is what I recommend. When you have a bug on your house, you get a paper cup. You put it over the bug. You slide a piece of paper under it. You carry the bug out, and you let it go. Because you don't want that <laughs> bug to get ticked off at you. And, uh, and if you think it's crazy, uh, just remember, just remember, if people, when the body dies, if a person gets out and then comes back in another body, wonder if you step on one of these things they get out of their body and then come back looking for you. It's not a good thing. <laughs> now, all right, all right. Now, this is why I'm saying this. Would you throw the next one up there? Tiny insect brains can solve big problems. Some bugs can recognize human faces. They can count and categorize. By Emily Son, and that's... Uh, Blah, blah, blah. According to a growing number of studies, some insects can count, categorize objects, recognize human faces, all with the brains the size of pinheads. The question is if these brains, if these insects can do these things with such little brains, what does anybody need a big brain for? Now, of course, when I, you know, I first read that, I said, boy, you see a lot of crazy stuff. You know, I, but you know what? I often, I sit, and Joan sometimes, you know, thinks I'm loony, which a lot of people do, but I sit a lot of times out in the front porch in the summertime and talk with slugs. You know what slugs are? <laughs> but they're terrific, and I, I put a little piece of cat food or something, and you know, they all come and they form a circle. And they come and they're all around here, and I said, this is terrific. I mean, you know, they know what they're doing. And, and then when it's done, they all, where'd they go? I mean... And so I figured, they must be talking to each other or something goes on in there. Anyhow, I always thought it was just instinct. I mean, they just do what they do because they're little robots or something. You know, how many, you know, it, what is, did the bee say, you know, I did two yellow flowers and six blue ones and... and <sighs> but can you imagine a bug that can do that? That the B says, let's see, today I'm going to try to do 17 flowers. And he does maybe 13 roses or whatever it is, and two dahlias and whatever. And then the B says, that's it for today. I did what I wanted to do. I'm quitting. <laughs> that's stupid. That's exactly what they do. They not only can count, because they know they did 17 flowers, you know, they must have a head B that says, uh, oh, you know, Charlie, whatever your name is, you do the 17. He said, I did 17 yesterday. Give me the little. And they can categorize. They can put it into categories. I know, uh, I, you know, and, but 
Well, you know, you, you, a lot of times, if they can recognize you, can you imagine? Remember, you know how you get when sometimes you, you say, God, there's a fly in here. And you say, these bring disease. You know, get rid of it. Imagine if there's two flies sitting there and you walk into the room. And the fly says, oh, my God, look at what's coming in here. It's in the, there's a human in here. He says, yeah, I know. These things are filled with disease. Try to get it out of drive it out. I'm thinking, why not? Of course. Look at this. Look at this. Lars Chitka present, presented his findings along with colleague Jeremy Niven in the journal Current Biology. Bigger isn't necessarily better. In some cases, it could be the opposite. There's a lot of evidence, on the other hand, that overall size is irrelevant when it comes to brain power. Among human, individuals with larger noggins don't have higher IQs. Whales with brains that weigh 20 pounds with 200 billion neurons are no smarter than people. You know what struck me there? They didn't say they're not as smart. They said they're not smarter than people with our measly three-pound brain that has just 85 million neurons. And, you know, so then we go on to the next one. Let's just, uh, on a smaller scale, scientists are finally moving past the idea that locusts, ants, bees, and other insects are simple machines that respond to events in predictable ways, said Sarah Farris, an evolutionary neurobiologist at West Virginia University. That's a witness. That's a credible witness. So this, this ceases to be crazy. This ceases to be nonsense. Study after study now shows that insects can in fact change their behavior depending on the circumstances. Honeybees, which have been the focus of Chitter's work, have tiny brains with fewer than a million neurons, yet the insects can classify shapes as symmetrical or asymmetrical. They can pick objects based on concepts like they're the same or they're different. They can learn to stop flying after a prescribed number of landmarks rather than after a certain distance. In other words, if they're assigned to do 18 flowers after 18, he quits. I mean, when I told this to people Tuesday night, they said, how do they know? I don't know. How would I get How could I ever know? I don't know what makes you go well, regarding and, and, and thinking about these things. What is it? Ants and bees have notoriously complex social systems. Along with other insects, they can move in a surprising number of ways to communicate or get around. It's wonderful to see that insects are finally being compared with equally with vertebrae, animals shared. They have smaller brains, but they still have complex enough brains to do these things. Many insects provide humans with unheralded services such as pollination, sustenance, and pest control, but some of them gross us out or worse. But now let me say something. Now we laughed at this. These things are intelligent in, in, in a way that maybe we don't understand. They talk to each other. They assign tasks. They know what they're going to do. They can recognize you and me. And they figure things out and they do them. You know what it means? Could this guy be smarter than us? And could this guy be looking for you? Look at, here he is right there. Yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Oh, I can't stand them. But what do you think they're saying about you? Look at her in the red. Oh, my God. There they come again. But here's the point. If this animal, this being, can figure things out, can recognize and knows what to do, and can sort it out, and can figure how to survive and do things, why can't a virus? You see the point here? The point that's being made by science is that the swine flu virus, they're afraid it's going to mutate. What's that mean? The virus is going to say, we've got to figure a way out to get around this vaccine. And so the virus will try all different combinations until the mutation takes effect and bingo, the next thing you know, they've made an end run around the, um, uh, an end run around the vaccine. So uh, we can laugh at these kind of things, but, you know, when we say, well, you know, a virus, how small is a virus compared to this? Okay? Well, how small is this compared to a cat? How small is a cat compared to to, uh, you know, a dog. How small is a dog compared to us? And then it goes on and on and on. It's a chain. So, I don't know. 
This is crazy stuff. But there is something that exists in these things. And there is some kind of an intelligence that exists that can be very dead. But you see, the thing is that when we become so uh, anti-nature, we, we cease to even understand this stuff. And so as strange and as wacky as this sounds, when we take the possibility of that having an ability to figure out ways of survival, then we have to take it down one notch to the virus and say, does that have an ability to figure out the survival? And it's true. They do. They do. Last week, we, we were discussing the fear-mongering going on concerning 2012. And, you know, and, 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 and the movies and all of that, it takes it to a bizarre, a, a, a bizarre amount of, you know, buildings floating out. And then what I did, I went over the statements of Amaya Shaman from the Book of Destiny. I'll show you a picture of the book in case any of you wanted to take a look at it again. That's it. It's a, called The Book of Destiny, Unlocking the Secrets of Ancient Mayan Prophecy of 2012 by Carlos Barrios, who's a shaman and member of the Mayan Council and so forth and so on. And, and basically, we, we just went over it. The book put into perspective what the prediction was actually about. And it, and it was a simple truth, you know, about made by a, a force thousands of years ago, that if people on the earth are not in harmony with nature and its animals, there will be a price to pay. I mean, I don't know if you're aware of this. It was on television tonight. Since this swine flu, and a lot of people are saying, well, you know, it's no big. Do you know that 600 little children have been killed by the swine flu this year in this country alone? 600 children are dead. And so, well, why? And it's like the scientist at, at, at John Hopkins said, because, you know, we're, we're, we're doing things that are counter to what nature would have us do in harmony, in the way we treat the animals in factory farming. So if you exploit nature so as to enhance the corporate need for money, nature's going to react. If you brutalize animals in, like factory farming, then you're going to have things like swine flu. You, you know, you wouldn't, if the air is dirty in your home, you, you wouldn't stand for that. You wouldn't stand for dirty water in your home. And, but large corporations, they, they pollute and they make obscene profits. And, and then everybody's coming around trying to figure out, what's 2012 all about? 2012 is simply the prediction. I don't believe it was made by Mayans. I believe it was made by this emerald UFO force thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. And all they were doing was teaching us. They said thousands of years ago, look, you've, if you're going to be on this planet and you're going to survive and you're going to have a good life, you've got to stay in harmony with nature. That's the whole thing. That's all it was about. And if you violate that, then it's gonna, there's going to be problems. See? And I'm telling you that, you know, my, I, I know that this was an emerald alien force that said this. It wasn't anything spooky, anything bad. Just all they were saying from the very beginning was, be nice with nature. See? And this came from what we call Mayans because a detachment from the emerald force located in the land of Kem, which is now Egypt, made their way to South America. It, 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 we showed you this before, but take a look at it. This is what happened uh, from Crystal Links. 1300 years BC, Egypt, which was the ancient Chem, was in a turmoil, and many delegations of priests, forget the word priest, just understand it's been written thousands of years ago, were sent to other parts. Some of the pyramid people who carried with them the emerald tablets, this group bearing the tablets emigrated to South America where they found a flourishing race, the Mayas. Now, you've got to remember, we're talking about something 30,000 years ago, written by people 3,000 years ago, you know, and a lot of legends, a lot of stories, but something happened both in Egypt and something happened in South America. And among these, they settled and remained in the 10th century. Uh, the Mayas thoroughly settled the Yucatan, and the emerald tablets were buried under the Temple of the Sun. So anyhow, that's the way... Um, the legend has it, that's the way legend has it that um, the um, 
information or this technological information got to South America. And we have um, scientists all over the world talking about industrial pollution contributing to global warming. John Hopkins, scientists warning about a virus that can kill millions from factory farming because you're eating antibiotics every day. So we not only can't get along with nature, we can't get along with each other. We've got World War I and World War II and Korea and Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan and Israel and Palestine, the World Trade Center. What is it all? People killing each other, bombing each other, blowing the smithereens out of planet Earth. Why? They, and nobody knows. Well, they don't believe the way we do, you know. They're, and all of these things are a failure on the part of people on planet Earth to flow in harmony with each other and with nature. If everybody, if, if people had listened to this emerald force and they were flowing in harmony within each other and with nature, this wouldn't be the planet Earth, it would be the planet Heaven. But we never did that. So after doing all of this violence to each other and to nature and to its animals and then using our technology not to improve health and welfare, but rather to improve the deadly ability of our weapons, what does one expect? Why should we be so surprised that a warning has come down and nature says, you know, enough is enough? We have, we, you know, you know it's an, we, have, we always have these religious people telling us, these are, this is God's creations. They're the first ones to encourage the government to go and drop bombs on somebody else. And they want to drop bombs on all the people in Iraq and all these places because Jesus is going to come back in a hail of bullets. That's exactly what they believe. But let's say, well, let's say, for instance, that Ampakel Votan, who you know is attributed with the saying, you know, giving us the um, Mayan prediction of 2012. What if I say to you, "Do not warm up your car in your garage, or you will kill everybody in the house." Well, you wouldn't do that, would you? But you know, there are some people that do. They don't know any better. Oh, they don't want to go out in the cold, so they'll warm the car up in the garage and kill somebody. Now, what if I say to you, look, if you don't take care of your animals, they can get diseases. And that can actually affect you. <coughs> so you, you realize it, you take them to the vet. But you see, the problem is this. There's another house that your house exists in. You live in your house, okay? But outside of your house, nature lives in the celestial house. The house outside of your house is the universe. The earth is the floor of that house. The sky is the ceiling of that house. And all the things that we wouldn't do in our house, we've done in the cosmic house. We have dirtied it. We have dirtied the water, we've dirtied the air, and we abused all of the living things in this house. <sighs> so we come down with many diseases. We, we have animals and we love the animals. I got pussy cats and, and everybody loves them. Well, they're so cute and everything. But yet we turn our back when these same animals are taken to these factory farms and piled on top of one another and, and stuck with antibiotics. We don't want to know about that. We just want to go to the restaurant and have a nice dinner. We don't know the terrible suffering that we inflict on nature. And yet we go into shock saying, oh, what is this 2012 stuff? So instead of facing the reality of 2012, okay, we're treated to the stupidity of these movies that, that are trying to make millions of dollars with the planet spinning out of control. 2012 has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with spirits. It has nothing to... It has to do with us. We created it. It doesn't have to happen. You know, we, we still got time. If we do the right things, we've got all of 2010, we've got all of 2011, and we've got all of 2012. We can do it. But if we don't, 
if we continue what we're doing now, then we've had all of 2010 for it to get worse, all of 2011 for it to get worse, and all of 2012 to get worse. It's not God. It's not demons. It's not aliens. It's us. Now, about the Emerald Force that landed so many thousands of years ago before there even was you know, in Egypt. We get so stupid when it comes to the existence of people living someplace else. I don't know anybody that lives in the Amazon jungle. I don't, I've never been there. I have all my family has died, so I tell everybody they're all in the North Pole. They may be. I don't want, I've never been to the North Pole. Maybe they are up there. I don't want to know. But, I, you know, so what? But, you know, when it comes to someone living on another planet... I don't believe when I started it. It's just a different neighborhood. They live in a different neighborhood. Regular men and women, just like us. You know? If you, if, if you go into a, a jungle, a primitive jungle, and you bring a television with you or a cell phone, you'll be considered a god. That's all we've done. We call these things gods and spirits and angels. They're just people that were here in a time when people didn't know about this stuff. But when someone comes here, they're gods. Why? They're very advanced and we're very primitive. We still are very primitive. So we think they must be strange creatures with antennas sticking out of their heads. Like this. But that's not what's described in the book of Ezekiel. Not a little green man with sunglasses on and all of this stuff. You know what they describe? A man in a white linen suit. Like that guy over there. So think of that, and then I'm sure that the Bible would be describing something like that if that was the case. But see if it's more like that. Let's go to the, to the book of Ezekiel. And, and when the living creatures went, the wheels went with them. You know, a thing took off anyway. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. That's the way you would explain it. I mean, you know. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. You know, when the fastest thing you've got is a mule, <laughs> that's a flash of lightning. What else does it say? Six men came from the way of the hog. These are guys that get out of the UFO. Which lies to, and every man had a weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's ink, and they went in and stood besides the brazen. They, they didn't say strange little green guys with pointed chins and big eyes and, you know, sunglasses. They said, no, these are just guys. Regular, normal guys. See, in, in, in yellow, there's a description of the UFO. In white, a description of the beings who got out of the UFO. Men. And what kind of weapons did they have? You know, if you think, this guy in the Bible, oh, jeez, what is this? Because he said there was such a roar and a, that everybody else around him took off. And he stood there with his mouth open, you know. It's like anybody. Did you ever see a UFO? You stand there with your mouth open. That's the way you do it. And you don't tell anybody, but this guy so let's go, uh, let's go back to the Emerald UFO Force in the beginning. And what does the Emerald Tablet say? And this is what it says. Fast we fled towards the sun. In other words, they took off. Until beneath us lay the land of the children of Kem. Beneath us. There they are down there. Okay, let's go. The flying. Raging, they came at us with clubs and spears lifted in anger. Here they come. Here we are. Here's your ancestors. This is your great, 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 great grandpa. <laughs> Seeking to slay and destroy the sons of Atlantis. Here they come. All right? So what, what happens is they fly over. They see the land below them. They land and they, they're in touch with the cavemen of the prehistoric men. And how did the Emerald Force respond to these guys running after them with clubs and spirits. You go back to the Emerald Tablet, and what does it say? 
Then I raised my staff and directed a ray of vibration, striking them still in their tracks as fragments of stone. In 2009, we would say the cop tasered them. It's exactly the description that's given there. So in both instances, in the Emerald instance and in the Bible, the ones from the UFOs had weapons, and in both instances, they were just men, just normal people. Normal people who happen to live in a different neighborhood in the universe. Uh, people have no problem thinking men landed on the moon, but for them to think that some men might have landed on Earth, oh my God, I can't believe that. And what did they try to do? They simply tried, according to the Emerald Tablet, to instruct us in how to live in harmony with nature, something we've never been able to do. And it's no different when our culture goes to primitive places and we try to help them improve their lives. The entire point to be made is what is the nature of spiritual and religious cultures we've been following all of our lives and what are they saying? We've gone to church. I've gone, John and I have gone to every kind of church there exists. We've read Bibles. I've read the Bible through four times. We've sang songs. This is the day that the Lord had. You know, everybody's done that one. And we've argued theology and doctrine. We've quit one church and we joined another. We've gone to services because we were encouraged. We've made donations. We, you know, where they want us to place symbols in public and we've got them. We've got the you're going to see them all now with the nativity. We do all kinds of things, but we have no idea concerning the nature of what we're praying about or singing about. Isn't this amazing if you think that you're singing songs about aliens? What? Yes, this is the song. I'm singing about an alien coming down in a UFO. The next time you hear, you see a UFO, wouldn't it be something if Jesus is sitting in the cockpit? And after all of this, it's more realistically thinking that he died. We want to go to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. How do you get there? I want to see Jesus. That's what they sing. Remember when you got a gospel news? I want to see Jesus. Okay, you got to die. He goes to every doctor in the neighborhood. Don't save me. Say, you don't want to see Jesus. Stop. Don't lie. You don't want to see Jesus. But we don't believe that there is anything like heaven in the universe. Where the heck is it? Well, it's there. Somewhere. You know, the preacher up here in New Jersey raises his hands and look up, looks up here. The preacher in Australia raises his hands and looks up. But you know what? They're both looking in different directions. One's looking towards hell because they say heaven is up here and hell's down here. But the guy in Australia is looking down to hell because he's upside down. Yeah, it's stupid stuff, isn't it? Isn't it stupid? And we go and we pay them for that. There you go. Oh, it's great. Give me money and you'll get your reward when you go to heaven. I got a deal for you. All you have to do is give me $10 a week. And I'll give you a brand new Cadillac car. And you'll pick it up when you go to heaven. <laughs> It'll be waiting for you at the gate. You'll see the license plate with your name on it. And the license plate, you'll notice it says, Sucker! <laughs> so we're comfortable with angels, we're comfortable with spirits because we don't want to get realistic. We don't want to consider these to be aliens and photons. All the people in the world have some kind of God story they've grown up with. We all have. And you are expected to believe it or there's going to be bad consequences. And we fight each other over the stories. We kill each other over the stories. And yet the very people who show up to express belief in the stories really don't know. And so the yellow tablet has given us a starting point. 
And these people who came to Earth in UFOs are the ones we have been referring to as God and angels and Jesus and Krishna and Muhammad and Yahweh and all of that stuff. Strangely, what we've been finding is that the Emerald UFO Force, whether it's true or not, has connections to all of them. I've gone over and over with you strange connections of the Emerald UFO Force with the number eight. Let's put it up here. It's important. Number eight. The number eight, as a result of coming from the Emerald Force, involves everybody, including Jesus, Buddha, Nostradamus, Nasa, and why? What the heck? I don't, you know, I'll tell you right now, I don't believe there's anything supernatural in a number. I don't, it's, you know what that is? That is a, that's a curvy line on a, on a, on a piece of paper or on a board. Well, what's, what's it got to do with anything? Why should that, you know, well, uh, you know, if you add these up together, they come out to eight. So what? That is not going to pay your mortgage or pay the doctor. Well, so what? They got eight. Who cares? What cosmic significance does it? Do you remember all the eights? Do you, do you remember all the eights that are connected with December 21, 2012? Uh-huh. Now, just think of something. UFO, Emerald 4. Is it hot in here? Yes. Turn the air conditioner on. No, don't worry about the heat. Just put the air conditioner. Yeah, yeah, just turn the air conditioner. I'm not using any heat. Um, now, just think of this for a minute. The UFO force lands in Kem before it's Egypt. You don't have to believe that. Who cares whether you believe? It's not going to change anything. But Toth, who's the head commander of this group, is called the God of Eight. And he reports to the eight deities commanders, forces, whatever you want to call them. The god of eight, he, to the eight deities, comes from Heropolis, which is the city of eight. Everything is eight. Eight, 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 eight. What? Why? Part of the force takes off and lands in South America. And what do we see from the Mayans, John? The Mayan calendar, I always thought, was... A wheel with eight spokes. I always thought the Buddha calendar was a wheel with eight spokes. But you know what I found? It's not. It's an eight-rayed star. So the Mayans all of a sudden have a connection to eight because the UFOs landed there. The Buddha has a connection with eight. Nostradamus does his prediction about 2012 and is filled in his quatrains with references to the eight-rayed star. The History Channel does a, a show and they show the connection between Opiochus, Sagittarius, and um, Scorpio. And when those three meet on December 21st, 2012 at 11.11, it will make a form of an eight pattern. You go on a History Channel and you can see how they describe that. Jesus, according to the Gnostics of Egypt, thousands of years ago, and this was before he was Jesus and he was connected with this UFO force, gave them the sign of the eight-rayed star. I want you all, please, now this happened 20 years ago when Charles made this platform. I want you all, please, to look what's on the front of here. It's the eight-rayed star. This was put down 20 years ago when we had no idea what it was. NASA, you can't see it here, but it's an eight-rayed star. The all-seeing eye in heaven, which is the hourglass nebula, figure eight. Supernova 1987A, which I say is um, the seventh seal of the book of Revelation, is an eight. And the emerald tablet is called emerald because the emerald tablet is an octon stone, which means it's eight-sided. Everything is 88888. 88888. Including the fact that the sun, in its orbit, through the constellations, traces a figure eight through the constellations. And including the fact that Jesus' name in Greek, I-S-E-O-U-S, has a numerical value of 888, which is the mythical. What is all of this? A big coincidence? 
course not. So I was uh, sitting as I usually do. You know what I do? <laughs> After I had been talking to the slugs and the <laughs> ants and stuff, I sit and I say to someone that isn't there physically, what am I going to do now? What the hell am I going to talk about? I, I can't even conceive of where do we go now. And my, now, I didn't hear anything. Nobody came flying through the window. But my mind was filled with Etta Carina, the winged nebula, which I have proposed is the seventh angel of the book of Revelation, which is very, very important when it comes to 2012. I couldn't understand it. And I said, why is Etta Carina coming into my mind? I have proposed that Etta Carina is the seventh angel of the book of Revelation. Joan will show you a picture of the seventh angel of the book of Revelation. There are several reasons. Number one is it looks like an angel. There's the wings. I mean, it looks like an angel. The second reason is that Etta Carina is connected with the Pegasus, which is a white seahorse. And if you look close enough, you can see the white seahorse outlined right on the side of Etta Carina. The third reason is that Etta Carina, the word Etta, is the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. So I got seven, I got the white horse, and so forth and so on. It is... Its wings are covering the brightest light in the universe that no one could look upon and live, okay? The Carina star. And then what capped it off is I'm looking about the seventh angel, and I see it says, it is connected with the son of David. The astrophysicist who directs the Etta Carina project is from the University of Minnesota, and his name is Chris Davidson. That's enough. That was enough. That convinced me that it was the seventh angel. But what does that have to do with eight? I'm involved with eights. So what am I going to go to the seventh angel? I went to Wikipedia. And I looked up Etta, which is the seventh. And this is what it says. Eta, uppercase Greek, seventh letter of the Greek alphabet in the system of Greek numerals, has a value of eight. I got an eight, didn't I? Out of the seventh angel, Eta Carina. See? If you're crazy, it pays off. <laughs> you find stuff that other people might not look for. Because I said, ah, I'm not going to look there. And then I said, why is this in my head? You know what's funny? It, it always happens when my mind focuses on things like this. I, I get things from other people. And I did get stuff about the eight rage star this weekend. Now, what have I proposed? I propose that Jesus Christ was actually the Emerald UFO commander. Now, I can see what you're thinking. Here's a guy with sandals and a white sheet, and he's going to jump in a UFO. No. No. The story was written 30,000 years after the appearance at the land of Kemp. And they wrote in the way that they tried to put together the legends and the stories and the mistakes and all that. Come up with something. And so they had to find somebody and, and, and all of this stuff. You know? So we're not talking about somebody who lived in Jerusalem. We're talking about a person, a character in a story that was placed in Jerusalem by the Hellenists, which were part Jewish too, and create this, this story about the sun. Because all of the Emerald Eight UFO people were the messengers of the sun. And so then Jesus Christ, if I'm correct, was the UFO commander of eight from the city of eight, reporting to the eight deities. So then, when the Hellenists come along, they say, well, you know, that Toth that the Egyptians said was the leader, and Hermes, which the um, uh, Greeks uh, Greek said was the leader, was really Hermes Trismegistus, which means they were one person. See? So we had that, and then these same Hellenists who created Hermes Trismegistus as this commander gave us the name of Jesus, which has the value of 888. They wrote it. 
Jesus' close friend turns out to be John the Baptist, who we find out was Elijah, who originally left the earth in a UFO. And, and then the, the teachings of the UFO commander from the uh, Emerald and Jesus are very, very familiar, are very uh, familiar with the word I'm looking Similar. Look at this. In white, the alien. In yellow, Jesus. The alien. I began this incarnation where the river of life flows eternally. Jesus, who believes in me out of his being, shall throw rivers of living water. The alien, I descended, but in a time yet on board, I will rise again, for surely will I return. Jesus, I go away and come again. Tell no one until the Son of Man be risen again. The alien, strong were we with the power drawn from the eternal fire. John the Baptist, he, meaning Jesus, shall baptize you with fire. The alien, they linked with the children of light who dwelt within the temple. Jesus, believe in the light that you may be children of the light. The alien, I dwelt in the land of Chem doing great works. Jesus, the Father, will show me greater works. The alien, I go to Amenti to come face to face with the dweller. Jesus, I go unto him that sent me. The alien, lift your eyes toward the light. Jesus, he that follows me shall have the light of life. For God's sakes. <laughs> it's the same guy. And that makes it so, so wonderful because this alien was teaching us how to live in peace and love and in harmony. There is a connection here. And of course, 888. In addition, the mythical symbols of Toth and Jesus brought forth a connection. John. He that does not take up his cross. Now there's this picture of Ta. And look at the cross. Show the next one. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. Look at the single eye. Okay. Don't worry about a guy with a head like a bird. That's all symbolisms. It's the same person. Is it possible that Jesus 888 with the same teachings and knowing UFO Elijah could be the Emerald UFO Commander 8. He gave the Egyptian Gnostics the Coptic Key. And what was it? The Coptic Key was the 8-rayed star. Why that? Why not a 6-rayed star? The 8-rayed star. It is the 8-rayed star. And if it is, then we have more proof of Jesus' identity. And that eight-rayed star also opens us to doors that connect to 2012, as well as other myths and legends to the Emerald 2012. And Jesus presents the eight-rayed star to the Coptics of Egypt. And now I'm going to show you eight-rayed stars shown throughout every culture practically since the beginning of time. There they are. Here's an eight-rayed coin. See it? That's a coin with the eight rage star. And of course, the Jesus star. And you know what it is? You, you can't even attach this to one person because every deity has a different name. They're all different. They all have different names. The ancient coin. See, I'm not looking at this for numerical significance. I'm not interested in the eight, what eight mean. What I'm trying to do here is connect Jesus to the Emerald Force Commander of Eight from the City of Eight reporting to the deities of Eight. As you look at these eight raid stars, it's important. There is no mythical character connected because they come from all different cultures where the symbols all relate to a different name. But what do they have in common? They're all eight raid. See? And where did the eight come from? The eight came from a time before all of these cultures existed when that fleet of UFOs came and landed in the sands of the land of Chem before it was Egypt. See, it's the same way. They, they, they may have a, a name of Anu meaning something. It's the same way where the, Toth, where the Egyptians called them Toth and the Greeks called them Hermes. You go all the way back, but you're going to go back to one entity. You know, and as I said, it's just, you know what, this is true. I had people that came here and left because this was an anti-Christian sign. It should be a cross. It wasn't a, a sign. You know, I left. What is that? 
What is that strange sign on the front of that? I knew that. Oh, this guy, I tell you, this guy's going to infect you with the satanic shit. I want to show you a picture. I want you to see what you see. This is a picture of the Vatican. What's that? You know what that is? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's an eight rayed star. Okay, find all this stuff. I know if I looked over there, I'd find something like that. Right in the front yard. Now, there's a couple of other interesting eight raid symbols, and they come from a website called firstlegend.info. Can we show them? Here they are. All right. Now, this really gets interesting. It gets rather complicated because many of the ancient cultures involved, you know, are, are, are so different, but the ones you're looking at, the one on the left is the sun. The one on the right is the Rosetta Stone, or not the Rosetta Stone, but the Rosette, okay? What the first legend website found is that the ancient sun god became an eight-rayed symbol that you see on the left. Wow! And you know why that's so interesting? Because the UFO commander, the god of eight, from the city of eight, reporting to the deities of eight was, as he proclaimed, the messenger of the sun. See? He was the sun god, if you wanted to call him. And what happened is, this eight raid here became the goddess Inanna. I-N-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Inanna. You know what her mother's name was? You all call, many of you call your grandmother by the name. Nana. Nana. That's right. Who do you think you made it up? <laughs> and Nana was the most ancient Sumerian goddess of love, recreation, and new life. In Babylon, she became the goddess of love and sexuality. Do you know what her name was? In Babylon, love, new life, recreation, her name was Ishtar, from which came the name Easter. New life, sexuality, love. In fact, in the temples in Babylon, the ladies used to come on Ishtar Sunday and all they wore was a bonnet because their job was to recreate. And that was their service for the day. Really? So Anana takes us back to Samaria, and that's where Zechariah Sitchin, who wrote The Twelfth Planet, says the aliens landed in UFOs and adjusted the DNA of primitive humans to redirect human life. Isn't that interesting? In other words, somebody was looking down and said, when you get down here and land, you better take a couple of them and uh, get them together. But before you do, we'll make a little adjustment because these people are going nowhere. <laughs> so Inanna and the Eight Raid Star takes us there. And if you look again, we'll go back and, and we'll look at the uh, stars I showed you just a minute ago, and I will show you the original eight rayed star in Anna, which obviously came from the Emerald UFO force. It's right here. That one there. That's the Anana star. The eight rayed star. Now in Somalia, there was a god named Utu. Okay? He was the brother and the wife, excuse me, the brother and the husband of Inanna. And guess who they became? Adam and Eve. And that's where the legends come from. Let's look at this. From uh, First Legends. I was looking at the eight-spoked icon that represent the wing disc, the star, the sun, and the rosette. 
I realized that the symbol of the dingir, D-I-N-G-I-R, that hovered above the tree of life linked both Inanna Eve and you to Adam. Adam became represented by the sun god and Eve by the rosette. It was an epiphany, if you will. Here Adam had been hiding in plain sight in some representations of the rosette. There was a dark circle credited as a seed. There is also a circle in the center for you two, which looks like a hub. This feature with the eight rays are very similar to the Sumerian dinger, also with a central hub. The point being made by them at first legend is that not only did the Sumerians who Sitchin said were connected to the alien UFO force first give us Easter, but they gave us the Adam and Eve legend as well. Now, I'm going to show you the Sumerian dinger, and we're going to look at Wikipedia and see that. And here it is. Joan, hit it again, would you? The Sumerian dinger, which is here, the area, originated as a star-shaped ideogram indicating a god in general, or the Sumerian god An, A-N. The supreme father of the god dinger also meant sky, or heaven in contrast with the earth. This, what you're looking at, is an actual stone from ancient Samaria. And if you look, and you can't, you can't see it from there, I know, but if you look at the third row down, you'll see the dinger, the eight-rayed star. The third line from the top is translated in Anna. Huh? Interesting. So the number eight of the MOUFO force becomes the eight-rayed star, which comes to us as a Sumerian symbol, which Zachariah Sitchin says was the point of UFO alien involvement. And in everything leading all the way from there up to December 21st, 2012, even to the pattern that a History Channel shows us is eight. It's an eight-rayed star. And you're looking at the person sitting right here in this room where we have had the eight-ray star on this podium for over 20 years, long before we were aware of these things. But it was somebody who put it there for a reason, wasn't it? And so from all of this of Inanna and the eight-ray star, we got Adam and Eve, we got Easter, we got the eight-ray star formation, uh, we got the uh, Mayan calendar, the Buddhic wheel, the contrains of Nostradamus, all of these things, which we'll show you again, all of this stuff comes from the eight-ray star, from the Emerald UFO commander that we've showed you before. All of this, and add to it that the sun's trajectory makes a figure eight through the constellation, and no, also add to it, that Jesus Christ's number in uh, uh, the Hellenistic in the Bible is 888. So let's go back to our original point of connecting Jesus as the Emerald Commander of 8, reporting to 8 from the city of 8 with the Greek number 888. And we go back to the Emerald Force, Samaria, and Inanna, and we find this that the dual nature of Anana was explained that the star, an eight-rayed star, represented Venus as the morning and evening star which Inanna as Venus eventually became. So we have Venus, the morning star, eight-rayed Eight raid. You ready for more? Watch. Yeah. Venus orbit is slightly inclined relative to the Earth's orbit. Thus, when the planet passes between the Earth and Sun, it usually does not cross the face of the Sun. However, transits of Venus do occur in pairs separated by eight years. Eight years. The renewal of the grand cycle of Venus, patterns in the sky occurs once every eight years and was of enormous significance to who? The ancient Maya. Why? Because they were from the Emerald UFO commander of eight. And results may provide new insight into the architectural philosophy behind astronomically oriented Maya structures. I'm telling you folks, you can forget Maya when you talk about this, and you can think of the Emerald UFO Force and eight. 
So the grand cycle of Venus occurs once every eight years. We have traced Venus back to Inanna of the Sumerians who Zechariah Sitchin connects to the alien UFO force, which we have connected to the Emerald Commander of Eight who reported to Eight from the city of Eight. Venus, the morning star. One more thing about Venus as we reconnect the Sumerians and the Emerald Force. This is from www.dgwilson.com. Dot com. Watch this. Visible outflow of the eight-rayed star. See that? For the Egyptians, this was the Agdad. That means eightfold. Greek. Place of eight arising from the heaven god Atom, which you know as Adam. The primal ut uh, unity and giving birth to his external form. It was from this primal location that the Egyptian town Kum, which also became Ken, eight town, took its name. The Greeks named the town Hermopolis. The root concept was carried forward into modern times as El Ashumain from the Coptic word for eight. Here we have the eightfold, which is the Ogdod or the Emerald, connecting us to the Emerald UFO force. We have Kem, which is eight town, where the Emerald force originated, and it is now El Ashumain or eight. So we move on to Venus. Visible out for the eight-rayed star, the ancient Sumerians depicted an eight-rayed star in the center of On, dividing the sphere of heaven to eight parts. The star was the goddess Inanna, identified as the planet Venus. Precisely the same imagery is presented by the Babylonian star of Venus, the goddess Ishtar, or Easter. So now we connect the eight-rate star, which finds its way through the Mayans, the Emerald Force, Jesus, the Coptic Key, the Buddhas, Nostradamus, 2012, <coughs> as outlined by the History Channel, and Jesus at 888. And in addition, we have the eight-rate star connected to Ishtar, which is Easter, and Jesus as 888. And of course, Jesus also connected to Easter. Back to Wikipedia. Venus is the second closest planet to the sun, orbiting blah blah, Earth days. The planet is named after Venus, the Roman goddess of love and beauty. After the moon, it is the brightest natural object in the night sky. Venus reaches its maximum brightness shortly before sunrise, for which reason it's often called the morning star or the evening star. The ancient Sumerians depicted an eight-rayed star in the center of On, identified as the planet Venus. Eight, 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 all over the place, the morning star. And that Samaria is where Sitchin portrayed the alien UFO force, where the alien commander was the commander of eight from the city of eight, reporting to the eight. And here we go. It's all there. The clue is the eight-rayed star, which is Venus, connects to the morning star, which then connects to the commander of the emerald UFO force. Can we do that? Uh, just now, I want you just to pay attention with me for a minute. What we've gone through, we have the eight-rayed star. Okay, we've talked about that. We connect it to Ishtar, which is Easter, which connects to Jesus. We connect it to uh, 888, which is Jesus. And we connect it to Venus, which is the morning star. And we know that the Emerald UFO commander did dispatch uh, forces to communicate this message to all of us. Now watch this, will you? I want you all to stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. And look. Revelation, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He's eight. He's Venus. He's represented by Venus. He's represented by the eight star. This is Jesus right in the front of this as the emerald UFO commander who started the whole thing with the eight great star.
Jesus' teachings, the same as the UFO Emerald Commander of Eight from the City of Eight, connected to the eight deities. His name is the number 888. His close friend left the earth in the UFO. He gives the Egyptian Gnostics a symbol of the eight-rayed star. The eight-rayed star comes from the Cenarians who initially were closest to the Emerald UFO force of eight. They connect the eight-rayed star to Anana, which attaches to Venus, the morning star. Jesus is proclaimed in the Bible as the bright morning star. Now I'll put something in your head that I'm just starting to work on if I haven't put anything in your head yet. What is going to happen on December the 21st, 2012? It happens every 26,000 years. It is the movement into Aquarius, the man with the pitcher of water. If the UFO commander and the fleet had landed on the earth not 36,000 years ago, but 26,000 years ago, when we moved into Aquarius the first time, would not that say that if Jesus was the UFO commander and did appear the first time 26,000 years ago, that a UFO fleet landing in that area of 2012 would be the second coming of what we call Jesus Christ, but what is actually that emerald UFO commander. And did not the scripture say that the way he left and it was said he was carried up into the sky is the way he would return? Will the second coming be a fleet of UFOs from another dimension? The evidence would seem to point that way. I don't know. But I'm saying, the evidence would seem to point that way. Now, th this here has been an awful lot for you to sit and put in your little heads. And I have people writing feverishly here. But let me tell you what I'm going to do um, for you that come here. I'm putting this stuff on um, the website. Not in a, not in a uh, video form, but in the text form, just as I read it here. And what I'm doing for people that come on the website to try to keep things going here is charging $3 for the code. Because when you go on the website, you have to plug in a numerical code so that you can put the code in and unlock it. Anybody here that sends me an email and asks, I will give you the code for the first uh, six. Well, right now I've got four on. I'll give you the code for the first four, and then when the fifth and sixth are put, back, are put on, I'll give you the code. That way you can study all of this yourself. You can go around the Internet and look and confirm it yourself. You can uh, come up with ideas yourself. You, you'll have the uh, locations of the different websites and the different scientists yourself, and you can at leisure, because what I'm saying is so bizarre. But yet, I mean, I haven't told you anything that I haven't tried to document and show you is factual. But, you know, I, I need for people to see this with their own eyes. And be able to study it and take your time with it. You, you, you can't. There is no way you could have sat here for this hour and, and consumed all of this. I'm the first one to tell. There were some things that were pretty exciting. And I think with Jesus saying, I am the morning star, and the whole doggone thing focusing around the morning star, and the morning star being connected with December 21, 2012, that's a big deal. You see? Think of that. December 21, 2012, and every prophecy that you saw, all those eight raid things, are all the eight raid star. So if December 21st, 2012, including the eight raid star Jesus gave to the Gnostics, if that is all involved with December 21, 2012, then the morning, that means the eight raid star is the morning star. That means that this is the morning star. You see what I'm saying? This is the morning star, and so 
Jesus comes along and says, I am the morning star. I am the one who commanded the fleet and who came. And I am the one that the others who came thousands of years after wrote about. And as I said in the emerald that I would return, I said in the Bible they wrote that I would return in the same way that I left. And what an appropriate time to do it. Because as we enter into December 21st, 2012, we will pass over into the world of Aquarius. And when the disciples in the Bible said to Jesus, where shall we celebrate this Passover? He said, look for the man with the pitcher of water. When he enters into the house on December 21st, 2012, I added that. I'll be there. Whoa! See ya. Bye-bye.